Hello and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is David Novak. So I have been thinking about Edmund Wilson recently. I did a video about my Library of America editions, which contain a two volume set of his literary criticism. I also in the day read his letters and that's a very unusual step for me to have taken. He was a dynamic figure upon the literary scene and had much to say about everybody. He knew just about everybody personally. And I suppose that I was looking for guidance of some sort. I, I'm not sure how vital it would be to a, an up and coming writer or poet these days to uh, look at something such as this, but there were passages that I considered noteworthy at the time, and I thought I would share these. I also have um, some little bookmarks that I've put in, and I looked through them, and I can't quite figure out why I marked those pages. But I have a suspicion. But I will, I will, I will go to these, so I have something about Eliot, something about Cummings, and then something about Eliot again. And the, the Eliot, um, Eliot uh, passages, they, they pertain to Eliot, but they also pertain to uh, John Peel Bishop, I think. Uh, let me see, page 100 is the first one, and that is... I, I believe it's a, it's a letter to John... Peel Bishop, you can see that there. Um, and I, I won't read you the whole thing. Um, and this is actually very brief. I have been formulating some tremendous projects for my immediate future and shall presently impart them to you. In the meantime, be strong and for heaven's sake, do read somebody besides Eliot for a little while. He is enslaving your style and your imagination. I thought that was a, a very relevant quote. This enslaving the style and the imagination charge, I, I believe it, it went across the board and there were a lot of people who were destroyed by Eliot's work when it came out. Um, the next reference to Eliot, 274, and I believe it's also a, a letter to Bishop. Yeah, the, so th this is from 1936. When, when was that one? That, the, the other one was from much earlier. The other one was from 1922. So, uh, let's see. Okay. As, as I remember, you had sent me at the same time the poem about Allegra and the Quinspuds, which I have always considered one of your very best lyrics. I had told you repeatedly around that time that I thought you were developing your most successful and most original vein. However, the wasteland had just appeared during those first years when you were abroad, and it had a strange sterilizing effect on everybody, also the effect of making them precious. It's apparent already in your Fire Drake poem. I think it was all the worse for you, because you are certainly intended, it seems to me, to be a poet of sensuous delight, which doesn't exclude emotions, of course, connected with the soaring or passing or reflection of sensuous delight, not self-torture and Puritan wistfulness like Eliot. I don't think moods of pessimism really fit you. I don't mean that they're not sincere. 
but that you haven't got the native vocation for them, like Eliot or A. E. Hausman, and I would and would really rather be enjoying yourself, which is not the case with them. Still, I suppose Eliot gave utterance to emotions which ran pretty deep in everybody's life and re revealed a central social situation which was beginning to affect everybody. So I thought that was marvelous as well, putting his finger on the sterilizing effect on everybody which Eliot's verses had. Um, I wish somebody would do an anthology uh, just collecting uh, all of the writings by sundry poets who were particularly devastated by uh, Eliot's appearance or the appearance of certain of his poems. Uh, the Wasteland was certainly one. Uh, William Carlos Williams hated Eliot and uh, did not come off the better for maintaining his hatred for a long time. Uh, let me go on to what he says about Cummings, page 168. And here he is writing to Ellen Tate. So this is just the last paragraph in a letter. I have just been up to see Cummings and his wife in New Hampshire. He has been sober for weeks and I found him more interesting and satisfactory to talk to than I ever had before. He certainly has the most extraordinary point of view. It is 100% romantic. The individual is the only thing that matters, and only the gifted individual. In fact, only the poet and artist. The rest of the world is of no importance and has to take the consequences. He keeps protesting his lack of interest in anything outside the world of his own sensations and emotions, but at the same time he has a much keener sense than most people of what is going on in the world and is at bottom apparently perpetually worried by his relation to it. I don't know whether the type of pure rom romantic can survive much longer, though perhaps I think this merely because the romantic in myself has recently been giving up the ghost. Yours as ever, Edmund. Uh, that was a, just a very nice glimpse into the world of E.E. E. Cummings. I think that everything he says in that uh, paragraph can be readily obtained just from the poetry itself. If you read the poetry of Cummings, you already know that much about the man. Now let me uh, go into these bookmarks and, and just try to figure out what it could be. I think possibly, possibly I was um, wanting to see what he had to say about Chesterton because I see a mention of Chesterton, Chesterton here. Um, is it G.K. Chesterton? A uh, popular writer of some, I think there was a, a priest or something who was a detective, wrote some poetry as well. Oh, uh, so what is the sentence with him? So he, he read the life and letters of Lord Macaulay by his nephew, Sir George Otto Trevelyan. Trevelyan. I don't know how to pronounce those. I was fascinated by Trevelyan. It is one of the most entertaining books I have read this year. The first volume is particularly good. I don't think there's much for me to say about Macaulay, which wouldn't be evident to anyone else who read the book. He wasn't a complex or puzzling character. He was one of the most open, straightforward, and comprehensible literary men I have ever read about, and one of the most honest and admirable. He had one of those able, 
dogmatic, and stubborn minds of which Johnson was the great typical example in the 18th century and Chesterton a perhaps somewhat enfeebled one in our own, one of those essentially English minds which seem so difficult for Frenchmen to understand, which combine many good English qualities with some very bad ones. For Macaulay, with all his amiability and wide outlook, has a considerable share of English snobbishness and, moreover, had never a doubt in his conviction that England was, as he says in one of his speeches, the greatest, the first, and most highly civilized community that ever existed. Upon which Wilson appends his own exclamation point. I won't go on about that. I don't know anything about Macaulay. <clears throat> now what is here? A letter to John Dos Passos, something to Malcolm Cowley. Oh, yeah, there is a Chesterton thing here. Oh, just a throw-off sentence. I'm not interested in doing anything about Chesterton, though somebody ought to. I don't know. Somebody was asking him to do something. Yeah, so that, that's, that, that, that's where these are coming from. Yeah, so here's, here's more. Let's, let's just see what he has to say. I have no intention of persecuting any religion, but I am myself a complete unbeliever. And I know from experience that both the Catholics and the Christian scientists invariably make an awful squawk if anything critical is said about them. I remember that the New Yorker once printed a piece of mine in which I made fun of the Buckman group, but I have had the impression, perhaps wrongly, that you have been more careful about hurting the susceptibilities of the Catholics. Now, I know that the Catholic Church, as a pressure group, is a formidable power at the present time, but I think it is important to stand up to it. For example, I have just read the Catholic biography of G.K. Chesterton, published by Sheed and Ward, if I had been reviewing books, I should certainly have had to review it, and if I had reviewed it, I should certainly have had to say that it suffered from the intellectual squalor of the Catholic Church in America. This would have brought you indignant letters, and probably some people would have stopped their subscriptions. In the case of the New Republic, what the Catholics did didn't matter but it may be more serious with you. So who, who's he writing to? He's writing to Harold Ross. Okay. So, yeah, that, that's why I bookmark these. I uh, think I was thinking of doing something about that. Um, and this, this whole paragraph is nice. He talks about, I think, H.G. Wells and George Bernard Shaw. Uh, mentioning Yeats and, and Joyce as well. I, too, grew up on the school of Wells and Shaw, but though I still regard Shaw as a great man, I don't really think much now of the rest of them, except, in a smaller way, Max Beerbohm. At least, I certainly don't feel that our American crop that came a little later compare with them at all unfavorably. I can't imagine that anybody in the future will take Galsworthy very seriously or Chesterton. That period seems to me now to have consisted mainly of three great Irishmen, Shaw, Yeats, and Joyce. And that is where I will leave my foray into the letters of Edmund Wilson. I was 
thinking that perhaps it's time for me to get rid of this book. But seeing as how I noted everything of potential interest to me, I will put it back in its little cubby hole and keep that there. Uh, if you have any thoughts on Wilson or any of the writers he apprised, uh, please let me know in the comments, and thank you for stopping by my channel.